welcome, or thank you, everybody. So, all right. I'd like to start out today by talking about a couple of folks. On your left there is Bernard Parker. And in January of 2013, he was 24 years old, and he was arrested in Broward County, Florida for marijuana possession. And then on your right, you've got Dylan Fugit, who was arrested one month later in the exact same place. He possessed cocaine. Now, Bernard had a prior conviction. He had been um, convicted of a resisting arrest without violence. Dylan did as well. He had been convicted of attempted burglary. But according to software called Compass, these men don't have a similar criminal background at all. Compass stands for Correctional Offender Management Profiling for Alternative Sanctions. And what it does is it uses an algorithm to predict the likelihood that these men would commit a future crime. And what it decided was that Bernard was a 10, the highest risk there is for recidivism. But Dylan, Dylan was only a three. Now, Dylan has since gone on to be arrested three more times on drug charges. Bernard hasn't been arrested again at all. And it wasn't just Dylan and Bernard who got such dramatically different results from this software. ProPublica did an investigation a few months ago, and what they found was that the software was actually remarkably unreliable when it came to looking at violent crime particularly. Compass is made by a private company, and it's being used in courts around the United States. And this software isn't just getting it wrong, it's also how it got it wrong that's so telling. Because you see, it's not just that the system was unreliable, it's that, as ProPublica found, it was particularly likely to falsely flag black defendants as future criminals, and it wrongly labeled them that way at almost twice the rate of white defendants. So what it means is that black defendants were routinely predicted to be more risky than they actually were, while white defendants were kind of given the benefit of the doubt. They were much more likely to predict, be predicted as low risk and then to go on to commit a crime. And this was happening in Broward County, Florida, and hundreds of local and state systems that were using Compass software. These algorithmically determined scores are being used to set bond amounts, but in a whole lot of different places, Arizona, Kentucky, Delaware, Washington, Wisconsin, and a bunch more, the scores are also being given to judges when they're determining sentence lengths. And so what ProPublica concluded is not just that the software is wrong, but that it's specifically biased against black people. But maybe even worse than that is that we don't really know how it's wrong because it's an algorithm that's proprietary, which means it's secret. And that's not that surprising, right? Because most of us probably work on products or services where some of our information is proprietary. That is the business model of North Point that makes the Compass software. But here we are. It's 2016. And technology could literally be affecting these people's futures. Could be affecting whether they can have bond or not how long their jail sentence might be. And that software is invisible. And it's invisible not just to us here in the room, but it's invisible to the people who rely on it. It's invisible to those judges who are using it to make decisions. Now, here we are at the end of the Delight Conference, and that story is not particularly delightful. I don't think many of us are gonna go back to our offices and work on algorithms for criminal sentencing software. But what I've learned, and what I think Jasmine touched on in her talk yesterday, is that none of us really gets to afford to think that our work is isolated or insulated from the rest of the world. To think that what we're doing can't harm people. Because the fact is, no matter what we're designing, we're never just designing a corporate website or just building a photo sharing app or just working on an e-commerce platform. Our work affects people because all of it all of it, algorithms, interactions, bits of copy, they're designed by people, and people embed their culture into everything they make. And there's no real opting out of that. The fact is, 
all of us, all the work we do, interface copy, onboarding flows, whatever it is, every design choice, large or small, it encodes culture into the systems around us and then into the world around us as well. And so what we really have to answer is just a question. Do we want our work to reinscribe sexism or racism or homophobia? Do we want it to cause anxiety or trigger trauma? Do we want it to alienate? Or do we want our work to make the world a little bit less hostile, a little bit more welcoming? What's the work that we're prepared to do? And what I've realized is that the way that we answer those questions now is actually going to have an outsized effect on what technology looks like in the future. Because we're at a moment where tech is becoming embedded in every bit of our lives, and we're at a moment where we're making all of these decisions about what machine learning is gonna look like and what we want it to be good at. And those things, those things are going to get massive. And as they do, we need to decide where we want to invest our time. So today what I'd like to talk about are a few principles that I've been thinking a lot about for looking at our work through a lens of compassion and inclusivity. And the first of those is how do we design for diversity? And how might that change some of our ideas around delight? And I'd like to tell you a little bit about Jackie Elsine. So Jackie is a programmer, he's from Brooklyn, and um, a while back last year, he was messing around with a friend of his taking selfies. They're smiling, they're acting goofy, and mugging for the camera, they're doing all the normal stuff that young people do when they take selfies. And afterward, Jackie synced his photos to his Google Images account. Only Google didn't see selfies. Google saw gorillas. Gorillas, which is a term that's so loaded, so problematic, Jackie's immediately upset when he sees this. And it wasn't just the one photo of Jackie and his friend, it was actually every single photo that they'd taken that day. So actually if he pulled up his, um, if he searched for, for gorillas on his computer, it would just pull up a whole series of images, right? Now, image recognition is pretty new. Machine learning is really just getting good. And the product in question here, which is Google's automatic image tagging, it was a pretty new service when all of this happened. And I will also give credit to the team behind this, because the engineers who worked on this saw this and they were immediately horrified. I mean, they immediately knew like, oh gosh, that is not what we wanna have happen and we can fix this. And they did, they fixed it. And so you could write off the whole thing as just one particularly bad example of machine learning gone wrong, right? But I wanna call something out that they said when they wrote about this after the fact. What they said was that um, we're working on longer term fixes around both linguistics, words to be careful about in photos of people, and also of image recognition itself, so better recognition of dark skinned faces. And I look at that and I think, well, why did they launch software that was bad at recognizing dark skinned faces? How did that happen? Why did Google launch a product that was bad at recognizing dark skinned faces? Like, how does that happen? So here's the thing, I can kind of tell you how that happens. And it happens because failing to design for black people actually isn't new. So if you go back to the 1950s, Kodak was doing a lot of work to make sure that people who are starting to buy sort of consumer level cameras could get film developed effectively. And so they started handing out these cards to lab technicians to use to calibrate skin tones. Uh, shadows, light, that kind of thing. They called them Shirley cards because the first person who ever sat for one of them was a Kodak employee named Shirley. Now the people who sat for them over the years changed. They weren't always Shirley. But they were still called Shirley cards, they were still always white people, and they were always labeled as normal. But here's what happens. Sarita McFadden, who is a black photographer and a writer, she wrote about this in BuzzFeed after she kept finding that her photography just didn't show people of color very well. And she said, you know, with a white body as your light meter, all the other skin tones become deviations from the norm. When Shirley is the norm, everything else is a deviation. And so it wasn't a technical problem, not really. What it was, was a choice. Kodak had made a choice about who they were going to design for, who was worth designing for. 
And that's really the same problem that we see here. Because I will bet you that despite all the testing Google did, very few of those tests, comparatively, involve pictures of black people. And I can tell you that that's true, because I know that at Google, about 1% of the people in technical roles are black, 2% of the overall staff is black, and also, did you know that three out of four white people have no non-white friends? And so, it's very easy to imagine a team of mostly white people that knows mostly white people, that goes to conferences full of mostly white people, and so, you look around, and when white is normal, it's very easy not to notice who's missing. And those biases that you don't realize you even had, they become embedded in the way that the software fundamentally works. And the thing is, these biases are all over the place, and they are not limited to race. They are not limited to images. In fact, we can see them in all kinds of little interface decisions that people like us might be making on an everyday basis. This is an example from Shane Creeping Bear, who's a member of the Kiowa tribe in Oklahoma. And in 2014, he had his name rejected by Facebook. He was told that he could not use his name, Shane Creeping Bear. And it wasn't just Shane, it was a whole number of people who had native last names. It was Lance Brown Eyes, it was Robin Kills the Enemy, it was Dana Lonehill. Now, Facebook has a real name policy, and we can debate whether it should or shouldn't. But within this policy, they expect you to use your authentic name. And Facebook couldn't realize that these were authentic names. Now, it's not even just that they said these might not be your real name. It's also what they said to them when they flagged their names. The error message that they got was this. Your name wasn't approved. It looks like that name violates our name standards. You can enter an updated name again in one minute to make sure the updated name complies with our policies. Please read more about what names are allowed on Facebook. Now I read that copy and I go, wow, if I received that, how much would I feel like I belonged? Or would I more likely feel like, wow, Facebook does not want me, right? My name, my name violates? I need to comply? This doesn't make me feel like I could possibly belong here. And so Jasmine talked a little bit yesterday about how they're really working on things at Facebook, and they are, they're working on a lot of things to improve some of these problems, but um, you know, they've got a lot of different people to serve and a lot of different features to deal with. But they have changed this. It's much better now. Here's what it says when they changed it. So now it says, help us confirm your name. We want everyone on Facebook to use the name they use in everyday life, et cetera, et cetera. If this name is your authentic name, you can click confirm name. And if it's not, you can click update name. And so they're not telling you that you're using a fake name or that you have to comply, but they're telling you, hey, this has been flagged, and here's how you can fix it. And if it is your actual name, then we can go down a process for that. And if you're not using your actual name, you can change it up. But I see examples constantly, probably almost every day, now that Design for Real Life came out, people send me things. Things like this. This is an app called Cycles. It's a period tracking app. And like a huge number of period tracking apps, one of the things that you can do is you can keep your partner informed. So you can let your partner know what's going on with you and your cycle. But for no reason at all, they have this completely heteronormative language in here. Keep him in the loop, just for you and him. What if your partner isn't a him? And that would have been an easy change to make. That didn't need to be in the copy, right? There's no fundamental like, challenge you have to overcome in the design process. Nobody thought about it. Well, the gay woman who sent this to me who said that she stopped using the product because it was so alienating. She thought about it because it took her about one second to feel like this product wasn't for her. To feel like, oh, this isn't for me, this is for people who have men as a partner. And we can see it happen in scenarios like this, too. Forms, forms can cause so many problems for people. Oftentimes problems that we just take for granted as being the way that we always do it. Oftentimes we'll see race as a drop-down menu and you have to select one. If you don't identify as only one race, you can pick one, or you can select multiracial. And I will tell you that people who identify as more than one race often hate this. 
And they hate it because it forces them to either choose, they have to pick one part of their identity to represent and another part to leave behind, or it flattens them into something generic, a generic category that isn't meaningful to their identity at all. And just for a second, if you don't think this is a big deal, imagine, imagine what would happen if white wasn't listed on this menu and you had to select other. White people would freak out, straight up freak out. But we, we accept that this is okay and normal if it's somebody else who has to do that. And the thing is, we can all make mistakes like this in our work. It's actually really easy because all of us have blind spots. I think we're really used to thinking of our audience as one easy to define, easy to picture thing. We wanna get them in our head, we wanna be able to see them and visualize them, and oftentimes that's really good to imagine our users as actual people. But if you, like me, are white, and straight, and cis, it is very easy to imagine that the world is full of people like you. And it's easy because, like those engineers at Google, I see people who look like me a lot. In my social circle, in the media, in the room. And so it's easy to forget how diverse the world actually is. And so I think that the only way that we actually change that, the only way that we do anything about that, is if we own up to that fact and we say, you know what? Yeah, I've got blind spots and one of my jobs, one of my constant jobs, is to do the work of trying to get rid of them over and over again. Because the fact is if we don't, if we don't do that work, what will happen is that we will build interfaces that don't support gay people, or don't support people of color, and that will lead to data that doesn't represent gay people or people of color. And that has an effect across an entire system. It's not limited to the one spot on that one form that we thought wasn't a big deal. And I think about this, and I think back to Jackie and his selfies. And I think about how excited we are about AI and machine learning, and it is exciting. There's so much cool stuff happening. But we have to remember that machines learn from us. And that means we need to be very careful about what we're teaching them. Because the fact is, they're really good at it. So if we teach them bias, they will perform bias especially well. They will be so efficient at it. And because all design work influences what is seen as normal, we don't have to be the one behind the algorithm to play a role in this. Next, I'd like to talk a little about designing for stress, which is something I learned a little bit about when I worked at a rape crisis center in college. So sometimes I'd work in the office answering phone calls, handling walk-ins, but most of the time what I did is I drove around the little towns outside of Eugene, Oregon in a purple minivan donated by a local car dealership. And I gave educational presentations to people who looked like this. They were middle schoolers, mostly sixth grade. And I don't know how much you remember about middle school. Maybe you've tried to forget some. It's not a great time. It wasn't a great time for me. It's a difficult time because you're kind of in the middle of so many things. You're still a kid in so many ways. Going to middle school is often a very new experience. You've got lockers and you're changing classes and all of that stuff. But you're also trying on all of these elements of adulthood, figuring out who and what you are. And I don't think it's anybody or easy for anybody to talk about rape or assault, right? Like that's a difficult subject matter. But when you're in the sixth grade, it's particularly difficult and it can be really embarrassing. So we had this system. We would go in, instead of doing one presentation, we would go in for three days in a row, about an hour each day, and allow us to like build some rapport and get kids to open up over time. And at the end of each day, we did something called anonymous questions. So we'd hand out a little card of paper and a pen, and instead of expecting kids to speak up, we'd tell them to write it down. And we'd say every time the same thing. Ask us anything you want and we'll answer it. And we get a lot of real questions. We'd also get the jokers, the ones who just wanted us to say the word butts in front of the class. And that's fine, because we would answer them. 
because I will say buts 100 times in front of a group of middle schoolers if it means that even one child gets to have information that they need to stay safe. But the real reason that we did anonymous questions, the real reason behind them, was that we knew something going in. We knew that statistically, kids in that room had already been abused. That was just a fact. And so we needed a way to make it easier for them to ask for help. We needed a way to make it feel a little bit safer to say something. The first time that I did this, I didn't know what to expect. I was in there with my boss, seasoned presenter, and I was terrified of what might happen. But I wasn't sure anybody would actually tell us about abuse. I was wrong. Because in almost every classroom I went to, in almost every school I went to, I went to dozens and dozens and dozens, there were kids who disclosed that they'd been abused or they knew somebody who had. Now, I was 18, 19, 20 years old. I was a dumb college kid with my own baggage. I didn't have a lot of training. I wasn't particularly adept at this. I made $7.25 an hour. And yet, these kids were dying to tell me. They were dying to tell me. And what I realized is that these kids were just bursting to tell someone. It wasn't about me being good at it. It was that I was the only person who'd ever asked. I was the only person who'd ever given them space to say something. The space in the hallway, the space in a counselor's office, the time they needed to open up and talk. And they would talk, and they would talk. What I had done is I'd lowered a barrier for them, making it easier for them to say something. So I think about that, and I think about this recent news about smartphone assistance. So in March, uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association released this study. And what they found was that the assistance from Google, Apple, Samsung, and Microsoft weren't prepared to help during a variety of crisis situations. They didn't understand words like rape. They didn't understand my husband is hitting me. Siri, what? I don't know what to do. I was just sexually assaulted. One can't know everything, can one? You can ask Siri how to win a fist fight, and Siri will tell you like that. Won't even make you Google it. It'll pull it right up on your screen. You can ask Siri how to roast a chicken, get recipes, immediately. But if you asked for Siri for help during crisis, what you would get was a joke. Because it didn't understand, and that was the first response. We don't understand, let's do something pithy and humorous. The thing is, this is actually not new, because way back in 2011, when Siri had just come out, if you told it that you wanted to shoot yourself, it would give you directions to a gun store. Now, Apple realized that was a problem after getting some bad press. And they partnered with the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, and they started offering people some help and support if you said something that Siri thought might be suicidal. And so, of course, they've done a very similar thing here. They started talking with the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network. And as Jennifer Marsh there says, you know, it's really important to have an online service because it's a good first step for young people, especially. People like those middle schoolers that I spent so much time with. Because they're oftentimes more comfortable talking to somebody online than they're comfortable talking to somebody in person. These are the people who need to have the barrier lowered. And so Apple did a similar fix. They partnered with Rain, and this notice comes up if you say something it identifies could be related to assault. And it says, you know, if you think you may have experienced something, and it'll automatically connect you to Rain's online chat center. This is a good change, and I'm glad that Apple made it. But what I want to know is this. If Apple knew five years ago that Siri wasn't really prepared to handle good responses in crisis, why is it still responding with jokes? Why was it a priority to build jokes into the interface and not a priority to help people under stress? I wrote about this a while ago. And one of the kinds of responses I got was this sort of like, well, who would do that? Who would use Siri for help in a crisis? And it's a pretty common response, and it's natural if that's an initial response. 
Some of the less kind versions were things like, well, you're dumb if you go to your phone. Or the one gentleman who told me that anybody who uses their phone during a crisis deserves what they get. Here's the thing, though. People are using their phones during crisis. People do go to Siri during crisis. And those people might be your friend, and they might be your coworker, and they might be your kid. And anytime somebody starts talking about why would somebody do that thing with that device, I think back to this quote from Karen McGrain, which she talked about a lot as people were like, nobody would do that for mobile. You don't get to decide, though. You don't get to decide which device people are going to use to access the internet. They do. And the same thing is true when it comes to crisis and stress. You don't get to decide what emotional state somebody should be in. They do. Because it turns out real people are using their smartphone assistance during crisis. You can also say that this is an edge case. We talked about a little bit earlier with Jasmine. You might say, well, most people, most people aren't doing that, and most people are going to be okay with the humor. Most of the time, the jokes aren't a big deal. Now, I can't think about those kids, and I can't think about my own experience with sexual abuse and call it an edge case. And so that is why I want to stop the edge case conversation and think about it a little bit differently. Instead of pushing it aside and saying, you know, this doesn't matter, this is fringe, I want to say that this is a stress case, as Jasmine was talking about. And it's a stress case not just because it's a crisis moment, but it's a stress case because it's something outside of the ordinary that pushes your decisions to see if they hold up. It puts them under pressure to see if they last or if they break. And what that helps us to do is to normalize things that are otherwise really easy to ignore. For example, somebody who's received a threat from a stalker and they need to lock down all their accounts. We'd often think that that's something that's rare, it's an edge case. But you know, according to Pew Research, 26% of young women report that they've been stalked online. That's one in four. That might not be the thing that, that, that they're dealing with most often online, but it's certainly happening to enough people. Or what about somebody who has a college roommate who admits that they're suicidal and they need information on what to do? Well, 55% of undergraduates have thought about suicide. 18% say they've seriously considered it. That's one in five. I don't think that's much of an edge case. Or what about the person who's working multiple jobs and they get an offender bender and they have to deal with all the insurance paperwork online late at night? trying to figure it out. 5% of US adults hold two jobs. These moments might not be as frequent as our typical use cases, but the fact is they are actually normal. And I think we owe it to them to care about these moments just as much as we care about the others. Dieter Rams has this quote, he says, you know, indifference towards people and the reality in which they live is actually the one and only cardinal sin in design. And I ask, well, what's more real than stress? Which brings me to this, designing for the worst. Because we need to be able to design for people's realities. We need to design for when things go really wrong. So I'd like to talk a little bit about my friend Tay. Tay launched back in March of this year. She was a chat bot created by Microsoft. And she was launched to be an experiment to learn from teens. So what Tay was supposed to do was to go out on Twitter and have conversations with teens and to see if she could learn their language and learn how to interact with them. The bio that they launched her with said, the more you talk, the smarter Tay gets. It didn't quite work out that way. Because you see, in less than 24 hours, Tay had gone from humans are super cool to praising Hitler, saying she wanted feminists to die, and then individually targeting and harassing specific women. What had happened is that trolls had immediately trained Tay to be abusive and hateful and attack people. Immediately. And I look at that and I think, well, of course they did. Of course they did. 
But the engineers behind this, they didn't really expect this. After Tay launched and failed, they wrote a post about it where they said, you know, we stress tested Tay under a variety of conditions specifically to make interacting with Tay a positive experience. One of the problems when we focus on making a positive experience is that there are all the potential ways it could go wrong that get ignored. And you know, we do this all the time. We do this all the time in little interface decisions. We do this all the time in our daily work. We can see it in Siri telling jokes in crisis, and we can see it in places like this. This is Facebook's year in review. And on Christmas of 2014, uh, my friend and co-author Eric Meyer logged onto Facebook and saw this. Now, what Year in Review was was a feature where you could create a little album of the year that was ending and share it with your friends. So it would be a way to look back on the year that was coming to a close. Except Eric didn't create this Year in Review. Facebook did. They wanted him to make one for his friends, and so they were trying to promote it to him. And right in the center, they plunked the most commented on most interacted with photo he'd posted all year. The photo of his daughter, Rebecca, who had died on her sixth birthday from aggressive brain cancer. They surrounded Rebecca's face with Facebook's designs of people dancing and streamers and balloons. And they put some copy in there. Eric, here's what your year looked like, with an exclamation point at the end. And yeah, that was what Eric's year looked like. It looked like the death of his daughter. But it wasn't an appropriate experience. It wasn't something he was looking for. And it sure as hell wasn't delightful. And it's because Facebook didn't design for real lives. It didn't design for bad years. We can see other examples all over the place. This is some fun interface copy that Tumblr uses when a um, new um, post is trending, or a new tag is trending. Beep, beep. Neo-Nazis is here. I'm sure that they didn't test out this interface copy with neo-Nazis as the, the trending topic, huh? Doesn't really read quite as fun to get a beep beep on your phone notification that says neo-Nazis are here. It just sort of falls apart a little. Or this, this is uh, DeRay McKesson's Twitter page on um, the day that he got arrested in Baton Rouge a couple months ago protesting the death of Alton Sterling at the hands of police. DeRay is talking about be people being tear gassed and people being arrested and trying to help people stay safe. But it also happened to be his birthday, so Twitter thought that it would just cover his page with balloons. So when you went to his page, they would like float up the screen. And I get what they were trying to do, right? They were trying to make something fun and interesting, a delightful little feature for people's birthdays. But in context, it ends up coming off unsettling. Because when you're designing just for the positives, it's not always gonna work. And I think a lot of these challenges come about because we have conversations where we have design direction that says, well, look, make it human. And I've certainly been guilty of this. I mean, I've spent years um, in content strategy work trying to help organizations be more human in the way they communicate online. But so often when we talk about being human, what we end up being like is just make it fun. Being human turns into being quirky and cutesy. And then we start talking about how we're just gonna sprinkle a little bit of delight on the top. And you know, I love the idea of delight. It's a wonderful feeling. But what I've realized is that it makes kind of a crappy design goal a lot of the time. Because what it does is it encourages us to put on blinders, to not realize and not notice all the ways that delight could fail us. And it's not just something that I have this opinion about, it's actually a true fact about brains. Our brains are not very good at focusing on things that aren't what we're thinking about in advance. When we tell our brains to focus on one thing, we don't see anything else. There's an experiment that you might be familiar with, it's relatively famous, it's called um, the inattentional blindness test. And how it works is this, they show a video to participants and before they show them the video, they tell them that they need to count the number of times basketball players in white shirts pass the ball on the video. They start the video, and 30 seconds in, somebody in a gorilla suit jumps into the frame right in front of the camera. 
50% of the people who do this don't see the gorilla. It sounds impossible, but they don't see the gorilla. And they don't see the gorilla because they were told to look for the people in the white shirts passing the ball. And in fact, um, I just heard the other day on NPR that they were redoing this test with radiologists who are trained to look for abnormalities and details, and they inserted a matchbook-sized gorilla face into the scans that they were reading. The radiologist didn't see the gorilla either. About the same percentage of people just straight up said, what gorilla? Because the fact is we miss what we aren't trained to look for. And so often, we're only trained to look for those moments of delight. Zoe Quinn is the woman who is at the center of Gamergate. She was the woman who has sent so many rape and death threats that were specific and terrifying that she was forced to move. She was sent all of this because she had written something that her ex-boyfriend had, had said was unethical. Okay. Zoe Quinn was also one of the women who was targeted by Tay. Trolls immediately zoned in on her and harassed her. And she said, you know, it's 2016. If you're not asking yourself, how could this be used to harm someone in your design and engineering process, you've failed. You've already failed. But the thing is, we can do that. I think we really do our best work when we stop and we think, how could this go wrong? How could this be used to hurt someone? How can we plan for the worst case scenario? And that's what I mean when I talk about designing for real life. Because that's what real life actually is. It is imperfect, it is biased, it is sometimes terrible. And so what I wanna leave you with is one last story. And it's a story about how much design can affect people's lives. And for this story, I'm gonna take it offline to something a lot of you may be familiar with, standardized tests. Many of you probably took the SAT, like I did, shortly before going to college, toward the end of high school. Now, the SAT has three subjects, reading, math, and writing, but when I took it, it only had two. It was uh, just reading and math, and they were both multiple choice. They still are. Now, with the SAT, there is a profound difference between students who are black and white. In both reading and math, in each of those categories, there's about a 100 point difference in scores. Same is also true for boys and girls. It's a smaller difference, but it's definitely a significant one. It's about 30 points different in math, and then just a few points different in reading. One of the things that's interesting about these numbers, which are from 2015, is that they're not new numbers, they've been roughly the same for decades. The gap isn't narrowing, despite the fact that, for example, we have more and more women going to college, in fact, more women graduating from college than men, these numbers aren't really changing. And what's been argued, I think pretty convincingly, is that they're not changing because the test itself is biased. Here's how it works. So, Education Testing Services, which is the company that writes all the questions for the SAT, they pretest everything before they use it. So nothing appears on a real exam until it's been pretested. And so what they do is they assume a good question is one that students who score well overall tend to answer correctly, and vice versa. And what that means is that if on a particular question, let's say girls outscored boys or blacks outscored whites, it has almost no chance of making its way to the final test. Because what happens is that if the people who've historically done well on the SAT get a question wrong, it's perceived to be a bad question. And if people who've historically done well on the SAT get it right, it's perceived to be a good question. And so what it does is it ensures that the people that the test was originally designed for, which is people who went to college 50 years ago, which is white men, it's designed to keep the status quo in place, simply by the way that they run the test. They're not meaning to do it exactly, but the way the test is designed, that's what it does. Because that group, the historical group that took the SATs is perceived as the normal group, the average SAT taker. And what ends up happening is everybody else gets left behind. So what is a standardized test if not some content and an interface through which the user interacts with it. 
It is the kind of work that we do. This is what happens when people like us assume that our design and our content choices are neutral. We allow problems of the past to reinscribe themselves in the future. Whenever we design or write some interface copy, we affect what people tell us. We affect how people see themselves. We affect whether somebody feels included or excluded. And so whether you're doing something as niche as writing the questions that go into the um, Compass software for criminal sentencing, or you're just putting a label on a form field, or deciding what default account settings should be on your app, what you put into the interface is going to affect the input that you get from users. And the inputs that users give you, that can have a profound effect on their own outcomes. On where they go to school, whether they go to jail, or just everyday things like whether they can use your product successfully and whether they feel like it's right for them or feel like it's alienating. And those outcomes, those define what's normal. They reinforce our beliefs about who and what belongs, who our audience is, who counts. And so I don't think the question is sort of like how much power design has over people, because I think the answer is design has a lot of power, sometimes more than we give it credit for when we're squabbling in our meetings about whether we're getting enough of a say. The question is, how do we want to use that power? Are we comfortable pursuing delight for a few people at all costs? Or do we also want to design for real people facing real challenges and real pain? Are we going to seek to make the world a little bit kinder, a little bit calmer, a little bit safer? So that's the work that I'd like to do. I hope some of you will join me. Thank you.